Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Joanna Swanger and I'm the director of the Peace and Global Studies program. And it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Today's lecture is co-sponsored by the Betty Carter Peace Lectureship for exploring the religious and social dimensions of creating peace and highlighting Quaker contributions to the cause of peace by the Kazue Fukuda Hawkins Fund for bearing witness to victims of oppression, and the Bill and Ruth Simkin Lecture Fund for sharing experiences related to peaceful resolution of conflict in American society. It is in the name of these alumni with exceptional passion for justice and for peace that Earlham is able to bring us today's events. In so doing, we as a college seek to honor their memories. I invite you now to join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. In our communal striving at Earlham for justice and peace, it may seem that we turn ever outward, that we look to somewhere else, searching for a place where change may indeed be made. Often, however, the change we seek may require turning to look closer to where we currently stand, toward this place, the United States, where change might seem at one and the same time so much harder and, if we care to admit it, at least as necessary, if not more so, as change somewhere else. If we wish to raise the question, as Dr. Cornell West in his talk last spring charged us to do, of why it is we are adjusted to injustice and adapted to indifference, we must do that very thing. We must look with new sets of eyes and with new questions in mind at the United States. It is this kind of exploration and challenge in which our speaker today has been engaged. Matthew Pillisher graduated in 2000 from Bennington College with a degree in filmmaking. In 2010, he graduated from Temple University's Beasley School of Law and is now a licensed attorney in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. In the years in between, as Matt was living in Cincinnati, Ohio, he witnessed a great deal of poverty institutionalized racism and police brutality. In the face of this, and also the very clear drumbeat of war in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq, Matt became deeply politicized. He became an activist and worked with various groups against racism and poverty, for workers' rights, for women's and LGBT rights, and against military occupation. Matt entered law school with an eye toward understanding the legal structures that perpetuate the unjust status quo. During his last year of law school, he began to work on a film about the Philadelphia prisons. He interviewed those who were imprisoned, investigated prison conditions, and became an outspoken advocate for prisoners' rights and for transformation of the criminal justice system. His film, Broken on All Sides, will be showing here tonight at 7 p.m and I invite you all to return for that event as well. Our speaker today is a man who lives out the finest legacies of truth-seeking and peacemaking. His talk today is entitled Storytelling as an Advocacy Tool. Please join me in welcoming Matt Pillisher. Well, thank you to Gypsy, as she's known, um, to Lynn Knight for organizing this, and for, uh, to Cynthia Fadham, who's a friend from a long time ago where we grew up in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, who uh, helped bring me here. So the full title of my talk is Storytelling as an Advocacy Tool, Lighting the Path to Racial Justice with the Film Broken on All Sides. And so, um, with your help, I'd like to answer some of these questions today. Why focus on racial justice in the United States? Why focus specifically on criminal justice and mass incarceration? Uh, what is the ultimate goal? What tactics are available? Why filmmaking? And what have I done? So, um, 
why focus on racial justice and criminal justice and mass incarceration specifically? I'm starting off with the premise uh, that there's not racial justice in this country and that mass incarceration is a major form of racial oppression, which needs to be the priority of your generation as college students, my generation, as the biggest um, civil rights issue of our time. So since this is still uh, at least a controversial topic um, and one that uh, our society hasn't um, taken on thus far, I want to give a bulk of my time to explaining that position. I'll also argue that only a major social movement, something on the scale of the civil rights movement uh, of the 1960s and beyond can solve that problem. Uh, a radical redistribution of wealth and power are what's needed to solve this civil rights problem, uh, which would only come from a social movement, not through legal decisions or legislation from politicians without enormous uh, social pressure. And in order for that to happen, uh, we need to see masses of people organizing on the streets in communities and workplaces and schools. Um, and so how do we start to grow that movement? Well, partially it's the title of my talk, Filmmaking is an Advocacy Tool, it's an Educational Tool. Uh, and what I mean by that is combating the narrative in the mainstream uh, media and popular culture that's out there. Um, I think that's uh, the first front in this struggle for racial justice. Um, and I believe that in order to get people motivated and organizing, they need to be armed with the political framework with which to understand the problem and possible solutions. Uh, I'm especially interested in reaching people who are most affected by mass incarceration uh, and criminal justice and prisons, but I think it's also important to reach students, high school students, college students, young people, uh, like yourselves, who may not be um, the most affected by criminal justice, but have always historically been on the forefront of radical change and, change and social movements in society. I'll talk about how filmmaking can help with raising consciousness and how I'm trying to do that with my movie and the tour of Broken on All Sides. So let me share with you some statistics illustrating uh, the amount of racial injustice in this country. First, let's start with uh, general incarceration rates, which by themselves are horrifying. America has more people locked up than any other country in the history of the world. We incarcerate our people at higher rates than any other country. We have 5% of the world's population does anyone know how, how much of a percentage we have of the prison population of the world? 25%. So we have 25% of all the prisoners in the world and only 5% of the population in the land of the so-called uh, land of the free. Um, the statistics say that one in every 100 adults that you know will be in prison at any given time. Of course, we know it affects classes and races differently, so it may not be one in 100 for everyone in this room, um, but I'll get into that later. We have 2.3 million people, Americans, behind bars, and a total of 7 million who are under correctional control of some kind, so that means um, state-supervised probation or parole, halfway houses, prisons, or jails. That alone, I think, should be extreme cause for alarm, the amount of destruction this causes to people um, and also the money and resources that is being put into this uh, that could go towards other things. So why aren't people demanding changes? Why aren't people saying this is an utter failure you know, in the way we deal with crime? Uh, crime rates, they go up, they go down, but the prison population has continually expanded um, no matter what since the 1970s and especially in the 80s and 90s. So people are probably familiar with some of the policies we have today, but might not necessarily understand how we got them, um, how we got to this point. We have things like three strikes laws, harsh probation and parole policies, criminalization of nonviolent offenses like uh, drugs, um, which could be viewed as a more public health problem and so on. Uh, some people are starting to question these things. Um, the policies that were on some of the ballots yesterday in the election, um, there was a, uh, some legalization measures for, for marijuana uh, in California. They were trying to reform some of the 
worst of the three strikes laws which, which passed that has been so devastating to that state. Um, and so people are starting to ask, does this massive amount of people in prison actually stop crime or deter crime? In fact, it seems like the opposite is true, that we sweep people off the streets in massive droves, uh, make them usually plea bargain to a conviction because most people in this country don't actually go to criminal trial. We put them in a cage for various uh, periods of time that is extremely dangerous in prison, dehumanizing and void of education or positive social interaction. And what happens when people come out of prison? Um, we've branded people with criminal records a permanent scarlet letter that says society is allowed to discriminate on a whole host of issues, from housing to education, licensing, employment, public benefits, voting rights, and jury duty. We release people from prison often with huge fines to pay back in court costs, sometimes even for their, their stay in prison. Uh, people who the system has tried to break and destroy while they were inside the prisons. And then we release them back into our communities usually poor communities from which they came, with less skills, with certainly some kind of post-traumatic stress um, from the government contoned mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse that, that goes on, and the scarlet letter of an outcast. So for 60% of the population behind bars today, it's people of color. We'll return them to segregated ghetto communities from which they came to fend for themselves. And then we wonder why there's so much inner city crime. So how does all this, this system prevent recidivism? How does it prevent crime from being committed again? How does the system protect our citizens? I think it does the opposite. Our system might be fine if we thought that the only purpose of criminal justice was to punish for wrongdoing, that crime is bad, we need to punish the person who does the crime, um, that's all. Actually, that doesn't even work because we know that 95% of cases don't go to trial because defendants are pressured into plea deals, um, often amounting to convictions. Uh, but we know that innocent people are convicted every day um, thanks to organizations like the Innocence Project. Uh, but let's pretend the system is only there to punish those who've done wrong. Uh, is that really what people want? I think a huge reason, the number one reason we have criminal justice in this country um, is to prevent and deter crime. Ask people in high crime neighborhoods why they need more law enforcement and they'll say to do something about the crime in the neighborhood. And they don't mean an eye for an eye, they mean I want it to be safe for myself and my children as we go about our daily business, I want crime lowered. But we know our policies don't deter or stop crime and they actually seem to create more crime. Um, we know things like a stronger economy, jobs and training, living wages for people, better health care, mental health care, drug treatment. These things would do a lot towards preventing crime and, and uh, making more public safety. But money and resources are allocated away from these things uh, the more we pe keep people in cages. So we have this insane prison system that's eating up more and more adults, more and more resources, more and more of our youth, uh, more and more women. Women are the fastest growing segment of the prison population, mostly for nonviolent drug offenses. And as there are more and more mothers and fathers in prison, there are more and more families and children affected. For all the seven million people under correctional control today, how many tens of million family members are affected by that? How many kids? Um, what does it do to a child to lose a parent or see them in prison? What does it do to a parent? Of all the people who are released from prison with felony records who are permanently unemployable in our economy, how does that affect their ability to have a family, to provide as a mother or father, or to be a stable partner in a, a marriage or a relationship? And then on the other end of it, we have more and more people who are being employed in this prison uh, economy. Judges, lawyers, police, probation officers, uh, court clerks, prison administrators, guards. I was employed uh, by community legal services in Philadelphia to help people with criminal records. So you know, my salary was, was based on this whole problem. Um, 
Prison economy also includes construction companies that build and expand prisons, um, the, the privatized food services, privatized health care, companies that make these bizarre and cold furniture and fixtures that go inside prisons, uh, mental health treatment, uh, the laundry facilities, and then the companies who use um, prison labor, the companies that make monies off of prisoner phone calls, um, and uh, the transfer of monies for prisoners, and so on and so forth. You know, it's, it's a lot like when I hear, you know, people trying to pitch a Walmart coming to town, and, you know, they say this will revitalize the, common, the economy when it actually seems to do more harm uh, than it does good. We see town governments vying to get a new prison uh, built in town with the hopes it will revitalize economies that have collapsed in this era of global capitalism where this, there's no longer as much manufacturing or industrial jobs going on. And politicians also love it because they skew the representation um, gerrymandering uh, for the areas that get prisons. You know, prisoners are counted in the place uh, where the prison is uh, as far as uh, representational purposes for Congress, that means all sorts of allocation for resources and services, and they're not counted in the cities or communities from which they came. Um, and then, you know, this means more representation and political empowerment away from usually inner cities, um, areas with more people of color, and skewed towards rural areas with a, a larger white population. And at the same time, those prisoners usually don't have the right to vote. So it's just a very uh, twisted uh, form of democracy. And I think there's a couple of reasons that the whole country isn't up in arms about this. One, important people uh, are making uh, money and have uh, benefits from this system as it currently is, which I think we can talk about. That's a good topic for discussion and questions, but I really want to focus on the second reason, which I think the whole system and the way we think about crime has been racialized. And I mean that the majority of white Americans are able to pass this off as not my problem, um, that crime, public safety, it's a black problem, it's a Latino problem, it's the other person's problem. And so one of my main points is that this sort of inherent racist perspective, this underlying unnamed, coded racism is very alive and well in America. And um, it's harder to see. Um, but I think that's how this thing has been able to continue uh, perpetuating at the rates it has. So how has crime uh, been racialized? First of all, before we get into the propaganda around criminal justice and the culture that perpetuates uh, racial stereotypes, let's take a look at the shocking statistics of who is affected and targeted by criminal justice. As a country, we not only lock up more of our citizens than any other, but we also lock up more of our own racial and ethnic minorities than any other country. Those figures translate to one in 107 American uh, white adults behind bars, one in 36 Latino adults, and one in 15 black adults is in prison today. Most harshly affected and stigmatized are black men, uh, young black men. From the Bureau of Justice Statistics data, for every black man in the US in 2001, one in six had been in prison at some time. For every black boy born today, they have a one in three chance that they will spend time in prison. For Latino boys, it's one in six. Black people constitute about one million, nearly half of the 2.3 million prisoners in the United States, even though they make up roughly 13% of the US population. Uh, African Americans are uh, at over targeted and incarcerated at over five times the rate of whites, and Latinos are incarcerated at double the rate of whites. Indiana, um, just so you know, is consistent with that national average, uh, black people being 5.5 times more likely to be incarcerated than whites, and a little lower than national average, with Latinos being 1.3 times more likely to be locked up than a white person. Um, with the presidential elections fresh in our mind. According to the Washington Post, 1.46 million black men out of the total voting population of 10.4 million have lost their right to vote due to felony convictions. 
According to the sentencing project in Florida, Kentucky, and Virginia, one in five African Americans has been denied the fundamental right to vote because of their criminal record. Now, looking at the huge population of people of color behind bars, one could say, you probably wouldn't say it, but one could think that, you know, well, the racial disparities are there because of uh, inherent tendencies to be more criminal, to commit crimes, to be more violent. Um, you know, another more uh, racist argument, but something that needs to be taken on. Well, behavior among races, races is often similar based on circumstances, so it doesn't seem to explain these disparities. We know that people of all races use and sell illegal drugs at roughly the same rates, so blacks make up 13% of the population roughly 14% of the drug using population, um, but black people have made up 63% of all drug offenders sent to state prisons in 96, and whites made up only 37%. And in some states, 80 to 90% of all drug offenders sent to prison have been black. Uh, numbers become even more horrifying in the juvenile justice system where we're just starting to form an opinion of who is criminal and where young adults are starting to form an idea of how they fit into society. Um, according to the Justice Policy Institute, while African American youth comprise 17% of the youth population in the US, African American youth represent 27% of all drug violation arrests and comprise 48% of the youth detained for a drug uh, offense. Disparities exist in other crime areas as well, not just the drug war. Uh, even though behavior among races appears to be roughly the same. According to the Center on Disease Control's annual Youth Risk Behavior Survey, uh, African American youth report being in a physical fight at a similar rate um, to whites, 36% uh, versus 33%, but uh, black youth were arrested for aggravated assault at a rate nearly three times that of whites. And as Michelle Alexander, uh, the author of The New Jim Crow, explained to me when I was interviewing her for a, a magazine article in the spring, she said, when you control for joblessness, in other words, if you compare, compare black jobless men with white jobless men, the racial disparity in violent crime disappears. Joblessness isn't an excuse for violence. Most people who are jobless are not violent. But the reality is we know what conditions are likely to lead some people to break, to commit acts of violence. And joblessness, especially chronic joblessness, is a very good indicator of the level of violence that's going to exist in any community. So we also know that um, even if there are higher rates of certain types of crime among certain racial groups, without looking at the context of the situation, it could lead you to some racist conclusions um, about the inherent nature of some races to uh, you know, tend towards violence or crime. Well, if these studies don't make it to the general population, if I, if I didn't know this without conducting my own research for the last couple years, um, do we expect police and prosecutors to know it? You know, if people in general may harbor some incorrect racial stereotypes about race and crime, it makes sense that police officers, prosecutors, judges, public defenders would also be affected. There's a cyclical process of thinking in criminal justice that law enforcement end up targeting communities of color even more because they have higher incarceration rates. But their incarceration rates to begin with are skewed, um, not because of much higher crime rates or inherent criminality, but because of bias in where they choose to arrest and prosecute and who we see in society as the criminal. So there's a picture of racial disparities in our criminal justice. You're going to let me know when I get to 145, right? OK. So I think all of this has a lot to do with how we look at crime and why the majority of the population turns a blind eye to um, this system. Um, I'm going to skip a portion here, because I can tell I'm already running over time. I was going to go a bit into sort of the development of the Southern strategy and the conditions in the 60s, we had a dual crisis of a social crisis of the popular protests from the civil rights movement and other uh, movements, and also an economic crisis. 
um, with the, the post-war boom coming to an end and um, European economies starting to, to compete and, and eat away some of the profits of, of America. And it's during this time where the ruling powers sort of start to try and decide how are we going to deal with one becoming more um, competitive in the global economy. Uh, part of that is, is moving to places where labor is cheaper, so other countries. And a lot of those industrialized jobs had been in um, black communities in the inner cities to take advantage of cheap labor. And so at the same time, there is sort of the, the taking away of industrialized jobs in um, largely black urban communities. And you have the same population fighting and pushing for equal rights, civil rights, and uh, the ruling power is trying to decide how to deal with this, these uprisings going on all over the country in the 60s. Uh, at the same time, you have the Republicans trying to figure out how to steal away the voting base in the white South from the Democratic Party that had historically been Dixiecrat. Um, and so the Southern strategy, I'll just say this, um, can be summed up in one uh, of Nixon's top aides, H.R. Haldeman, wrote about Nixon's reaction to the uprisings in the 60s, and he said, quote, the president emphasized that you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to, end quote. So that's a glimpse of what the Southern strategy is, and I welcome more discussion about that uh, as we do the question and answer. But let me move along. Um, with, with the implementation of a lot of these policies in the 70s and the 80s, this get tough rhetoric that was really focused on um, the communities that I'm talking about, uh, the civil rights movement where people started to disagree. Uh, you were no longer allowed to be an open racist. You were never, you know, it was not okay to say segregation forever anymore. But um, you could agree with the tactics they were, they were taking. Well, I don't know if this lawlessness, you know, we need to get tough and restore order. And you see the Republican Party taking up this rhetoric that was aimed at white voters in the South in mind of stealing away that vote from the Democratic Party. And, and it worked. Um, and of course, the prison population shot up year after year after year. Um, and, you know, remember at the start of the drug war, Reagan's drug war in the 80s, um, he had the same uh, issue in mind, thinking about how can I take this vote? And um, the drug war that he declared was actually at a time when drug rates were on the decline. And the American population was not necessarily interested as the, in this as a major issue. Um, it took a concerted effort and propaganda to get the American public on board. And growing up in the 80s, like I did, uh, I don't know if you remember sort of the amount of propaganda around the drug war, TV commercials, uh, all those things, and particularly around crack. Um, and you combine all this with the stereotypes and the fanning of flames by popular media uh, and politicians, we see the ramp up of law enforcement overwhelmingly focused in communities of color and many white people turning a blind eye at best or cheering on the system at worst. And I think a serious culprit here is the mass media and culture um, that perpetuate incorrect racial perceptions and their relation to crime. I think that's part of why it's so important uh, for media uh, to put an alternative narrative out there, for independent media um, to put a different story out there, which is what I'm trying to do. Media has tremendous responsibility for what we think in society. Um, we know it's not the police officer's job to educate the public, to inform them about how to look at certain groups of people. Um, where, where do we get our education? We get it in institutions like this, in high school, in colleges. Um, and we also get it um, overwhelmingly through, uh, through media. We probably get a lot of it from our news, TV, popular culture, CNN, New York Times, Hollywood, the music industry. So I think um, some examples of reinforcing those racial stereotypes. Let me go through. Um, one might be the, the elevation of gangster rap in popular culture. Um, remember that it's uh, white people that are actually the largest audience for, for, the, for this kind of music, for buying these products and buying up these images of black youth as criminals. 
Uh, Michelle Alexander in her book has an interesting portion um, in the New Jim Crow where she says that someday we might look back on this era um, and look at gangster rap and the record industry uh, around thug culture as a form of a minstrel show. Um, like the kind that was created during slavery and Jim Crow, uh, where either white people in blackface would perform or black people were made to perform skits that would portray black people as dumb or simple-minded, oafish or obedient. Gangster rap served to portray all young black males as criminals, thugs, disrespecting women, um, something to be feared. And um, society is buying this up currently. Um, there's, you know, political rap or positive rap, things like that um, are not being pushed by the record labels or, or pur purchased. And I think part of the reason maybe they're not being uh, pushed by the industry is because it's threatening to their own interests. Um, stuff like, I don't know if people listen to Dead Prez or Immortal Technique or um, Low Key, some great political rap, but that's not what's um, being pushed. Instead, we get images like gangster rap. Another example of the racialization of crime in the media is this term black on black crime. It's something we hear all the time but don't necessarily think about the implications. You know, they don't say white on white crime. They don't say Asian on Asian crime. Uh, it's really strange. So step back and look at how society um, is set up. We are very segregated by race. You know, there are white neighborhoods, there are black neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods. And um, so we have these segregated communities where crime is usually uh, intraracial. Most crime that happens involves a perpetrator and a victim of the same race. Um, and, you know, why is it that this term black on black crime is used or why was it invented? It pathologizes the problem. It turns an obvious product of areas with low employment, high drug trade that are segregated by race due to conscious policy choices. It turns that into a problem of the race, an inherent tendency to be violent or to commit crime or to want to self-destruct. People can bring up other examples um, of how the media portrays race in the discussion. I think the back and forth around the Trayvon Martin case had a lot of very interesting and sometimes horrible um, examples of this. So how do we combat all of this? How do we um, you know, begin to speak about the, the way we look at race, which can be a very hard thing to do? Um, how do we confront an entire way that a society is set up? Um, if the ultimate goal is to end the racial disparities in criminal justice, to end the misery and suffering for millions of people currently caught up in the system, and the tens of millions more who have family members or, or loved ones inside, how do we get there? If our goal is to rearrange the priorities in the society that say we need to lock people up to be safe, at the same time we defund schools, we close down workplaces, you know, there's no job training. So how do we get there? How do we defeat this current system? It's daunting to think about. Uh, but I think if we look back at any major change in society, uh, we see that it takes a mass movement to demand change, to organize for change, to create their own just systems, or to put pressure on those in power uh, to meet and give in to the people's demands. We know it doesn't happen with exercises like we had yesterday. It doesn't happen by voting for someone once every two or four years. Um, it took people fighting and dying for the freedoms we have during the founding of this country, during the, civil right, uh, during the slavery um, and the Civil War. It took massive organizing efforts and again fighting and dying for things like women's right to vote, for African Americans to attain equal rights, um, for women's rights, for, for a safe and clean abortion, uh, for LGBT equality, which is still ongoing. It took massive civil disobedience and soldiers' resistance to end the Vietnam War, so on and so forth. We look back and we see these systems that have been defeated and they seem undefeatable in the past. And we've done it, people have done it, and it has always been organized, you know, people, common people coming together and organizing and demanding change. 
Uh, and another thing we see with every single social movement that we take for, for granted or every social gain that we have today that we may take for granted, there, were, there was just a small group of people organizing for it in the beginning and the rest of society saying, you're crazy. You know, th that's how movements start, is small groups of people. Uh, there's the Gandhi quote I have here, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Really, that's, that's the beginning. It starts in small rooms and star meet, small meetings and people um, discussing these issues, reading a book, having a study circle um, around things like the new Jim Crow, um, or watching a movie, which is why I created the movie, to try and educate ourselves and start pulling in more and more people. Um, so, how, you know, how often do you hear some of the statistics that I read off earlier in the news? How many news stories are there about the collateral consequences of having a criminal record? How many times was the negative effects of the drug war brought up in the presidential debates? Not, not once. Um, so we need to do it on our own. We need to build grassroots networks and organizations where people can educate ourselves because they sure as hell aren't gonna do it for us. And all over the country today, there are instances of groups popping up and starting to organize around the issue of mass incarceration. And a lot of it is thanks to Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, which, which so um, well and cohesively and is so well researched explains this problem and how we can begin to try and fight it. Um, there's certainly friends groups and a lot of Quaker groups um, Unitarian churches that have contacted me that have done these study groups around the new Jim Crow and want to get the movie to sort of continue educating and pulling new people in. Um, but I also want to talk about the people who um, have the greatest power to lead this social movement, which are the people that are most affected by criminal justice and prisons. And oftentimes those people don't have the time or the ability to read long and complicated books on the subject. They have busy lives, and they often have had the poorest education in our society. And that's not to say that they're stupid or they need anyone to tell them that they are oppressed or things like that, um, but they, they need a political framework for understanding it. Um, you know, they know that their children are being targeted by law enforcement, they know the system is racist. A lot of times people feel isolated um, and I think they often don't know how to take on something like the criminal justice system or the weight of a family member's 20-year sentence or people who were formerly incarcerated themselves um, that cannot find a job, struggling to make ends meet. These people need a big picture political understanding of the system and how to fight it. And the right political framework um, can make you feel empowered. It can get, you know, together with others, talk about it, talk about these issues so you don't feel so alone, and you start to feel like you can do something about it. So that's part of what I am trying to do and why I chose filmmaking. Um, we have books, we should always be reading, 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 but as I mentioned, books aren't appropriate for everyone. Um, we're in a new area, era of media use where people are watching movies on their phones. There's Twitter, social media. We need to make use of all these you know, tools for social change. And although filmmaking has always been a powerful medium, I think it's more widely accessible now and easy to set up screenings with the advent of the DVD and everyone has a DVD player on their computers. It's a very cheap and easy medium uh, to reproduce and to show. So I made the movie broken on all sides to accompany books, um, important books that were written by scholars and activists. And I did so with the understanding that film can put a human face on the problem and it can catch people up to speed in a meeting within just about an hour and allow people to discuss how it impacts them locally, what they're doing and organizing for the next steps for social change. Activist groups can use it to organize and we can reach people who are most impacted by mass incarceration. Uh, you know, the importance of this project that I'm involved with is that until crucial communities of color are reached and given an essential comprehensive framework 
for understanding the problems that we face, we don't see, we won't see activism or organization of the level that we need to actually make change in the system. So education on this issue is the first element necessary to inform a generalized anger and direct it into empowerment and action. And this film, I think, offers a, the most concise way um, to bring people up to speed and give them the empowerment to, to start taking actions. Um, since the movie's completion in February, I've toured the movie to more than 20 cities across the, the country, uh, about 30 screenings that I've set up, organized local panel discussions featuring local activists and uh, people who are directly in, in uh, impacted by mass incarceration. I've distributed more than 500 DVDs, um, and other groups have bought the DVD and played it, you know, and created their own screenings and discussions across the country. Um, the film has been at nine film festivals and won some uh, Audience Choice Awards and Best Social Issue Documentary. And the premiere was at a major fundraising event for Occupy for Prisoners, which was a part of Occupy Oakland, uh, where Angela Davis and Elaine Brown spoke on a panel for the first time in many years, uh, both who were former leaders of the Black Panther Party and are civil rights activists and prison activists today. So, um, as I said, the, the essential strength in the movie and in film in particular, this powerful medium, it can educate and inspire audiences very quickly in the inexpensive, widely used DVD format. And so I'm hoping to expand um, this tour that I've been doing on my own for the last several months that is, uh, I've been working full time, fully funded through um, selling the DVD uh, and doing speaking engagements and where people can pull together some money to bring me out. Um, and I've applied for a, a Soros Foundation social justice uh, fellowship so that hopefully, you know, I have a steady income and then I will allow me to go to more places um, because we know everything takes money, unfortunately. Uh, my wife is kicking me for the amount of debt I've gone into uh, for this project, but it's something we thought was both, you know, we both thought it was desperately needed and it's our contribution and we're happy to, uh, do it as, as long as we can on our own. So I'll end my talk with the plans that I have for the coming year, um, assuming that I can get funding and continue and expand this tour. Um, I'm hoping to maximize resources and impact in communities that I think matter most. I plan on reaching three key groups of people across the United States, faith communities and particularly black churches, high school students of color, and formerly incarcerated people and inmates families. And of course, there's some crossover in, in those communities, but I'm gonna try and set up a tour for each of those, um, targeting each of those communities and having uh, screenings and discussions with, with those people. And so let me end there. I, let me, you know, I hope I've given you something to think about and um, I welcome you know, questions about the project, and I know I leaned heavily on the, the racial aspect of it, but I really do think it's something that we need to wrap our heads around and understand, um, and hopefully it will you know, make some people get involved with this struggle, so thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, we have time for question and answer and comments. Just a reminder, please wait for a microphone to come to you before you voice your question. Good afternoon. Um, I just had a quick question. So, We've seen kind of the evolution of prisons as coming from a rehabilitation system to now a more punitive system. And very recently, we've now seen the move from public prisons to more a privatized um, kind of structure. So I'm just curious as your thoughts to the overall privatization of prisons and the negative impacts that that would have um, on communities. Mm -hmm. um. One of the jobs I had in law school was working for an organization called the Pennsylvania Institutional Law Project, and they helped people 
who were um, locked up in one form or another, maybe in prisons or jails or detainee, immig immigration detainees. Uh, one of the projects they gave me was researching one of the largest private prison corporations in the world. Um, I think it was Geo Group. And they have a lot of prisons in Australia, and they're trying to make inroads in the United States. Um, the majority of prisons and jails in the United States are not privatized. Um, I think similar interests still happen, though. Um, in privatized prisons, so I came, you know, it's a, pri it's a publicly held company. It's a huge company, so they have shareholders meetings, and it's all public records, so I'm researching this. And the, you know, one of the executive board members, uh, it's all, you know, I think by uh, chat that they were doing this for their shareholders across the world. And it comes up that the executive is like, well, okay, we're the, there are these, you know, policies for harsher sentencing, three strikes, things like that. We need to be lobbying for this because we need beds filled. We need, you know, we have this many number of beds and they need to be filled. And we need to them to be filled so that we can create you know, prisons elsewhere and fill those. So I think that's, you know, that's the way that these companies are looking at it, just filling beds, which I think is disgusting. Um, but I think sometimes there's too much of a focus on just the private prisons because similar interests are in the state-run prisons. Um, you know, uh, the, like I talked about, there are money interests involved in state-run prisons too. It's just not quite as, insidious and, and obvious, I think. Um, so, you know, with the economic downturn in the last couple of years, there was uh, another prison company that offered to all, um, all the states across the US, hey, this is a great time to, to sell your prisons to us so, so we can run them. And luckily, there were not um, masses of prisons sold off and there were areas, I just went to Miami for a screening a month or two ago, and there was a plan to privatize all the prisons um, in the southern half of the state. People got together and organized, and they fought, and they won, and they stopped the prisons from being privatized. So I think it's a particular horrible aspect to it, um, but there are horrible things going on in the public prisons as well. My question is, I uh, occasionally have an opportunity to lobby the state legislature, and I know some people who are involved in prisons uh, that are Quakers in Indianapolis. Have you been to Indianapolis? Were you at the Heartland Film Festival? No. What can we do to get your film to Indianapolis? And how much do copies of your DVD cost? Because I know mm -hmm. two or three places where I could put that out. The Mankind Project would be interested in this. Mm -hmm. um, Right, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to um, get in touch with sort of the headquarters of the American Friends Service Committee to make sure like the word is out there to different um, monthly meetings and different um, friends groups that this is a tool that they can use because there are more and more Quakers that are getting involved with this. Well, Quakers have always been involved with prisons. Yeah, um, so I think, uh, one thing you could do, I have a sign-up sheet that is gonna be just as you go out the door back here. If you sign up, um, I can send you information. You can go to my website, brokenonallsides.com, and that has all the information of pricing. To buy it as an individual, it's just 20 bucks, and I'm pretty, um, I distribute it myself, so you're not dealing with a big company, you're emailing me, and I'm emailing you back. <laughs> so I'm pretty, um, forgiving of people that don't have a lot of money. There's a, t a tiered system, so community groups would be $50. But if people email me and say, we don't have the money, you know, we don't, we don't do fundraising, I'll give it to you for 20 bucks, and you can do a screening of your own. Um, film festivals cost money to get into, so everyone you have to pay for, so I ended up sort of giving that up, and I didn't have as much control of sort of like the environment of having a panel afterwards, so I gave up that. Uh, <laughs> And, and the, you know, the controversial nature of the movie, I don't think it's something that's gonna be picked up by, by mass media, so it's gonna to continue to be something that I self-distribute, and word of mouth is certainly my best 
promotion. So um, if you all are interested, go on the website, watch a four minute preview, come to the screening tonight. And if you like what you see and think other people should see it, please just spread the word. That's the best way to get it out there. Uh, hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for coming and presenting here. This is really wonderful for our community. Great. Um, within, as you've described, like on numerous occasions, like throughout your speech, there is a whole economic system that kind of underlies uh, our current prison system. Um, and I think Emma was kind of touching upon this with her conversation about privatization. Um, but as in a broader sense. Um, yeah, in many ways, I think it's e there are arguments made where you know if you have an economic structure underlying a system, you know, the economic structure is valorized, and you say like look what happened to the economy, look what you know we we need although there are these effects, we need the underlying economy, and that it's off so it's you know put in sort of an omnipotent position. You can see that in slavery and you know other institutions. How can arguments such as that and your experience be combated and uh, taken on? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, how can we take on the idea that, how can we dismantle the whole economy around, around it, basically? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you need to present alternatives for how you would deal with public safety. So um, I was in the Quaker class earlier talking about this, and I don't know if people are familiar with restorative justice, but that's a whole different way of looking at crime and harm in communities and public safety as opposed to criminal justice. And that would be one way of trying to deal with uh, harm that happens in communities. Um, I think that we would have to, Part of the reason it has to be a social movement is because it would mean restructuring the power and the resources in society. You would have to have uh, more job training, job creation in um, inner cities and in communities of color that is just not going to happen with the current people who are in power uh, and the current power structures that exist. Um, so I think it, you know it's it's uh, arguing that. When people, when we need to come up with money, we come up with it. When banks need to be bailed out, it's no problem finding the money in a couple of days. You know, when we need to invade this country or that country, we can find the money or we'll put it on a credit card and we'll deal with it later. But when it comes to average people having resources they need to live in dignity, you know, have decent health care, child care, jobs, things like that. They're not concerned about that. So we need a total restructuring of the values in society, and we need that to be led by average people. And I think that's part of why I think the Occupy movement, to me, was so inspiring. I'm from Philadelphia, so I went to New York, and I don't know what it was like here in, in Indiana. But I think it's really important to take on that message of how, how is it that we have such you know, skewed distribution of wealth and resources and power in this country and in the world. And that has a lot to do um, with, I think, the criminal justice system in the prisons. And um, so I think there need to be movements like that that expand, that take on issues of criminal justice and, and racism in order to begin to present alternative ideas for how our country should be set up or, or run. Any other questions or thoughts? There's one in back. Yeah, hi there. Um, a few years ago, I worked for the Census Bureau. And we were sent into prisons. I was li then living in New York State. So it was prisons in Connecticut and uh, New York State, all up and down, both state and federal. And we were given a very long interview to go through, by, um, which was, I guess, being commissioned by the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Um, what was striking was that this long, long interview did not ask any questions about, um, they wanted to know something about medical care like diabetes and maybe asthma. They did not want to know about head injuries or STDs. Um, there were a couple of questions that were where any kind of violence was sort of grouped together real quickly in a way that it was easy for the inmate to answer no. 
I had only one uh, subject who said, wait a minute, uh, does what my cousin did to me when I was 12 count? Mm. Um, so any kind of sexual abuse in, in the prison situation uh, was not probed for. Um, any other kind of violence was not probed for. Uh, on the other hand, it was probed extensively over and over again about when the first offense was, what kind of plea was, uh, you know, taken or given, um, you know, legal representation. Um, also, there were no questions that would elicit uh, information about learning disabilities or attention deficit disorder, which clearly were very prevalent in that population. So I was really disillusioned by um, the federal government not wanting to know all the stuff that was so relevant. I don't know if you have any comments about that. Um, yeah, well, I think that takes some compassion about why people end up in prison. And as a society, we don't have much compassion towards criminals. It's really the number one group of people you're allowed to hate, and it's perfectly fine. Um, and I think on the, the side of statistics, it's interesting because same crime rates and things like that, rape rates, things like that, prisons are not included. But imagine if they are included, the instances of rape in the country, of male rape and female rape, of violence would, would shoot up tremendously. Um, but those statistics are excluded from the national statistics. Um, and I think it's another uh, example of keeping that stuff behind the wall, and not letting the public see what's going on. Um, because I think if the public did see what's going on, they would be horrified. Um, and at the same time, you know, I didn't even get into how much money it costs to you know, keep someone in prison or jail for a year uh, compared to you know, the best drug treatment, mental health treatment, things like that. It would be so much cheaper to try and deal with some of people's underlying problems in another way rather than throwing someone who has a history of being sexually abused into the worst possible area you know, for that and then letting them out onto the streets uh, you know, with no kind of education or job skills or training. So, I think that's a inter really interesting comment. Thank you for bringing it up. There's a hand. Hi. Um, I was wondering what strategies you've used in the past to get the message in the film out to uh, public schools or high schools. Um, because I'm thinking my main connection back home is my high school and a lot of those kids end up going into jail. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't know if, if there are strategies with principals or you just show it in one classroom or if you can offer any suggestions. Thanks. Um, since I've been doing this pretty much all by myself, single-handedly, it's, uh, it's just been wherever I can get it into. So again, like if you have a suggestion and a connection, it would be great to, for you to introduce those people to the movie, the website, and see if it may be useful for them. Um, in my list of the three you know, communities that I really want to expand the tour towards in the next year is really focusing on high school students, um, particularly high school students of color, I think is a really important um, community to, to, to have this um, shown and discussed in. I've not done very many. Um, screenings, and I think the, the most I've done is actually in friends' schools, um, which is you know, usually a higher class and majority white. Um, it's still great to, to be doing that. Um, I did it for a friends' school in Philadelphia for middle schoolers even, and you know, th these are like 12 to 14-year-olds, I think, and it was amazing to talk this over with them. Um, very difficult things and you know they have more common sense than adults do sometimes you know because you're catching them before they're you know hammered over the head with like all this stuff about crime and race and so I think it's a great time to be catching people um, as they're becoming adults as their friends may be getting caught up in the system and these people are the future organizers of the country so um, 
any suggestions you have would be great to let me know. And if, uh, you know, if you think of something later, I also am leaving, I think there's a stack of business cards out by the door and I really would love to keep in touch and have questions or suggestions or disagreements. Um, you know, I know that this is a lot of information and I hope all of you will come out and see the movie because I think that really explains it and there's a lot of different viewpoints. It's not just me standing up talking, a lot of different viewpoints explaining the problems and some possible solutions. Again, Matthew. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for coming, and remember the screening is tonight at 7 here. Thank you.